good evening everybody <laughs> hope you had a great day as much as it can be and uh, we continue our master class and uh, i am looking forward uh, uh, to the today program so we will first give a chance uh, to go back to the previous talk uh, on uh, uh, tuberculosis and we got fantastic questions so so I will hand over to Shobana and, uh, and uh, pick some of the questions or maybe we get further questions which I will pick on the chat forum. And uh, when we stop those questions then we switch over to Professor Janez on gene therapy. And uh, the same way I will be picking questions so if there will be a little break inserted in the talk or after the talk or uh, uh, printed form or next week we come back we very much wants to have questions and make this interactive mm. okay so if shobana is here i can yep. okay that's great so i <laughs> hand it over to you shobana <laughs> okay so shall i just pick some of the questions that were submitted as is that okay as a start okay. i think and then uh, then uh, maybe if we get further questions uh, we shall see <laughs> okay so uh, what i did last week was uh, i'm not sure if this was the right thing but i picked out all the questions that were in the chat and i answered them on padlet so you can also go and see the answers back on padlet if you want to so um I'll, I'll just go through them in order and we'll see how far we go so uh, we had some great questions. So the first one we had was, is there a way to boost the immune system to contain the bacteria once the immune system weakens in people? So the best way to boost the immune system is, of course, by giving vaccination. So you give somebody the, someone a vaccination that boosts the immune system to recognize TB, and that's the best way to do it. Once somebody's immune system has already started to deteriorate, then they may get TB and then you just have to treat the TB. And of course, you can boost a weakened immune system by getting them well again and then getting them healthy by providing a good diet and um, just making them well in that way. But if their immune system is weakened because they've got some other underlying issue or because they're just aging, that I'm afraid is just a natural process of aging and there's not much you can do beyond just trying to stay as healthy as possible. Um, so then the next question we have is, how so how high is the risk of immunosuppressants used to treat COVID-19 reacting latent infections like TB in infected individuals? So I think the question here is asking, can the treatments for COVID then increase the risk of infection to TB? And the short answer is no. Firstly, because there is really no um, treatment for COVID at the moment. It's just dealing with the symptoms. Um, uh, so that isn't a problem. But there are treatments for other diseases that could cause a risk in TB. So I thought that's quite interesting for me to just explain to you. So um, I'm going to share one of the pictures that I showed you last week in one of the in my presentation last week, if I can. So if you can all see this now, you might remember the slide that I showed you for immune immunity. So this picture here, this slide here. And now this is the pathway for containing TB. And what happens here is you get these things called cytokines, which are produced, IL-12, interferon gamma, TNF. And all these are signaling molecules that are called pro-inflammatory cytokines. So they are signaling molecules that cause inflammation. And inflammation is the way the body tries to stop the infection from spreading. Now, some diseases like arthritis are auto-inflammatory diseases. So this is when our body starts to to produce inflammation even when there's not when we don't want it to. So the way we treat 
things like arthritis is by giving them anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, anti-inflammatory drugs then inhibit these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So actually, an interesting thing is that people who are treated with some anti-arthritic drugs, so anti-inflammatory drugs, actually have a higher risk of developing TB. So COVID drugs, not a problem. Anti-inflammatory drugs, may be a problem. Interestingly, I've just seen um, a report, an article from one of our researchers at Royal Holloway um, talking about uh, anti-COVID drug, which is on trial now. And the main way that that works is by producing nitric oxide. And actually, nitric oxide is also something that is used to kill TB. So um, even if there is a COVID drug that comes out soon, I don't think that's going to have an effect on the risk of TB. Now, just talking about this, somebody else later on asked the question about how um, TB is contained. So we know that you've got latent TB and that's TB contained. The bacteria is contained. And I'll just use this picture to just explain that as well. This cytokine here, tumor necrosing factor, is called TNF. It is involved in granuloma formation. Granulomas are a mass of immune cells. So this cytokine is a signaling molecule that tells lots of other immune cells to come along and surround the infected cell. And that forms a mass of immune cells that we call a granuloma. And that's how the TB is contained within that granuloma. So that was those two questions answered. If I'm going too fast or you want me to repeat anything, just put it into the chat and I can go through it again. Um, okay, so somebody asked about the BCG. How would the scientists who created the BCG know that the bacteria was weak even after 230 passages? How would they know when it was ready to use? use? Actually, they had to do animal testing. So you can only really give out a vaccine to humans after it's gone some rigorous testing. So they didn't know that it would have was weakened. They knew that passaging does weaken the bacteria um, and they would have hoped that after 230, it would have been sufficiently weakened. But really, it would have only been after they tested it that they could have been absolutely sure that it had been weakened sufficiently. Um, is there a chance that the mutations that occur during passaging could result in the bacterium getting stronger rather than weaker? There's always a possibility that a mutation can make it stronger. Generally, we think that mutations make things weaker because it's not the normal state. And that's generally what happens. But there is always a possibility that the mutation could make the bacterium stronger. But um, obviously, in this case, they knew that passaging does cause the bacteria to become weaker, and then they tested it. Um, so what else can we ask? There was a really another interesting question, again, linking TB and COVID. And would, would lockdown reduce the chances of vulnerable people developing TB? Now, you might think that it would do because you're, you're isolating people or you're keeping people at home so that they're not going out and spreading it. The problem is that the places where TB is most prevalent are places which are overcrowded, um, places where people are very poor and are living together in very crowded situations. And so this then is a problem because <clears throat> it's in those very places that you're now making people stay together. So again, I'm going to show you um, another picture which i hope you will be able to see of two different dwellings okay so you can see these two dwellings now this here on the my left is a, is on the left is a township in south africa and on the right is one of the largest slums in India. Now, between these dwellings, there is less than three meters in some of the dwellings here in the Indian slum. But you can see that if people are living in these kind of conditions, now they, these each individual 
dwelling could contain a whole family and that so it's not just one person living here but these are whole families living in just these one dwellings and then there's a thousands and thousands of people living in these townships and in these slums if you say to these people you can't go out anywhere and you have to stay indoors you can imagine that actually this is a worse place for it to spread so actually i don't think lockdown has had any will have any impact in the reduction of TB and we should just wait to see whether or not it actually increases the levels of TB or not um, but you can see that lockdown wouldn't reduce the effects of TB so um, we've still got a bit more time let me see if there's any other questions that we could go through um, I'm just having a look I think actually that's probably dealt with most of the questions that were asked. Um, is there anything else? Can you? Did you get any more other questions, Lexi? No, no, that's it. Sure. I think that's that it. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, as I said, uh, we did post this uh, uh, answers Shobana gave uh, also on the Podlet. So if it was a bit too fast then uh, please go back to that uh, uh, written answers and uh, it it was really a good collection of questions so that's why we are here very pleased that uh, that uh, you are interacting uh, with us so yeah. so it is a pleasure then to introduce uh, uh, Rafael Janes uh, professor uh, in uh, and uh, his passion is gene therapy so looking forward Rafael mm. Thank you very much, uh, Latsi. I'm uh, just about to share my screen, uh, if I can. So, look, uh, PowerPoint slideshow. Okay, would you mind confirming that uh, you can see uh, both myself and my screen okay, Latsi? It's fine, it's great, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the many of you who have decided to spend about an hour this afternoon uh, with us after, I'm sure, a solid uh, day of work. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about gene therapy and I intend uh, to discuss this uh, uh, quite extensively and give you an introduction uh, of why this is this is important and we why we work on this at, uh, at Royal Holloway. Um, let's see. This is the overview of the talk uh, that I'm going to be giving. Uh, I will tell you what gene therapy is, what is a rare disease and why these diseases are important. Uh, the relation between genes and rare diseases and, and whether all the genetic mutations are bad. And I will tell you about something that I personally consider really interesting, the, the way medicine is changing and how uh, some of the marketed products that have come into, uh, into market uh, very recently are based on this regenerative medicine approach of gene and cell therapy. I will, in a little more detail, tell you uh, how you can uh, or what you can do with gene therapy and and the P word pricing something that uh, it really is very relevant uh, in this context because the availability of a drug doesn't necessarily mean that everyone who could benefit from is from it is going to have access to it and I will uh, finalize the talk, uh, giving you maybe a couple of ideas for, for further discussion. And I will tell you about the event that we have at Royal Holloway on Rare Disease Day, which is coming up at the end of February. And, and the very inspirational people who, uh, who I've got to meet uh, uh, working in this field. Obviously, that is quite a lot to cover in, in a slot of about 45 minutes this afternoon. Uh, so rather than doing a, a detailed DALI type uh, painting, I'm going to do a very wide stroke uh, mirror type painting this afternoon 
just introducing you to the technology, giving you an idea of the importance, uh, and really, really more than uh, giving a lot of depth to the talk, I want to bring up ideas for discussion, and hopefully there will be questions to answer uh, next week. So, what is it, gene therapy? What is it that I'm talking about? Gene therapy can be defined as the deliberate alteration of the genome or the function of the genome to produce a therapeutic benefit. And in this context, why are rare diseases important? If by definition, uh, you know, you would think that the common diseases that many people are going to suffer from, like cancer or cardiovascular disease or so, uh, could be considered more important. Well, there is actually a, a technical definition of a rare disease. In Europe, a disease is rare if fewer than one in 2,000 people are affected by it. But taken together, there are more than 9,600 rare diseases. They affect 6 to 7 percent of people and take a disproportionate part of the health budget, about 20 percent. Six to seven percent of people means that in your respective schools, in the street where you live, in your local community, there are going to be people affected by those diseases. You may not know because there are many hidden disabilities, but there will be people affected by rare diseases. So rare diseases really all around us. In addition to that, most of these diseases affect children and 30% of people affected by them will die before their fifth birthday, which is obviously tragic. And the bulk of these rare diseases are inherited. They are passed on from parents to children, or more technically, they are genetic diseases. The diagnosis of these diseases can take a very long time. There is something called the diagnostic odyssey, which is the really long period and experience that people go through until they get an accurate diagnosis of their disease. It's not unusual to take five years. So imagine a, effectively a peregrination from doctor to doctor uh, with your symptoms, uh, many of them severe, uh, and the lack of an ability of, of the system to diagnose, in part because as many of these diseases are so rare, uh, doctors will not see them in, the, in their career. And uh, it, it's obviously difficult to diagnose something that you are entirely unfamiliar with. So there is a lack of awareness among professionals, but there is also a lack of validated diagnostic tests. And these diseases are often complex, so their care should be done at, at centers of excellence uh, meeting all these categories. But this is an idea of what would be ideal for these patients, not something that is done currently in practice. So the system is trying to adapt for this rare disease care coordination that would make uh, this type of treatment available in a patient-centered uh, manner. Um, so this makes these diseases particularly important as well. They are really something difficult uh, to cope with. Furthermore, uh, in many diseases for which a particular gene is responsible, so technically a monogenic genetic disease, the therapeutic target has been validated. And what do we mean by that? Effectively, in lay terms, it means that we really know what we would have to do in order to correct the disease. The question is whether we are able to do that. But uh, at least conceptually, we understand what we would have to do to correct the disease. And in addition, most of the gene therapy technology that I'm going to uh, discuss this afternoon has been developed and tested on rare diseases but will also be applied. In fact, it's currently being applied to common diseases. And as you can imagine, uh, the biotechnology industry and, and big pharma are particularly interested in the application of that technology, not just to the rare diseases, but also to common diseases. 
So why are we particularly interested uh, in this area at Royal Holloway? Well, we uh, work in various uh, of these rare diseases. I told you that there are over 9,600. We work in, on a handful of them. In my lab in particular, we, we have done work on a spinal muscular atrophy, ataxia telangiectasia, uh, and diseases that are not so rare, like Parkinson's disease or, or spinal injuries. And some other of my colleagues also work on either rare diseases or more common diseases using very similar technology. So we have uh, an important core of expertise in this area of regenerative medicine uh, for rare and common diseases at uh, the university. I'm, I'm very sure that you are all very clued up, but I thought that it would be worth it taking you back a little bit and just reviewing what a gene is and how it works in order to, uh, to have a better understanding of how these diseases arise. So in a very simple way, a gene is a segment of the genome and here you have like an expanded section of a chromosome and a particular gene uh, represented uh, with uh, black boxes for the various exons and the intervening introns uh, in the gene. And if the gene works normally, it will produce a protein, a normal protein. But you know that you can have genetic changes affecting uh, various genes uh, like the green bluff that I use here to represent a mutation. And in this particular case, the same gene, but now in a mutant version, may produce either an abnormal protein or no protein at all. And that may or may not be a problem. I've, in the next slide, uh, blown up this uh, a uh, karyotype that I was showing in which uh, this is earlier work of mine, a particular gene out of the maybe 20, 25,000 in the human genome is highlighted in green. So you have these chromosomes have already replicated. So each of them has two chromatids. And that's why you can see two copies for each gene on the chromosome. And the red is the particular, the centromere of that particular chromosome. And uh, this would be either the maternal or the parental chromosome, or the paternal, uh, and this would be the reverse, either the maternal or the parental for a, for a given cell. So it's quite remarkable. We have, uh, as I said, the green is just one particular uh, gene in the, uh, in the genome. We have somewhere between 20 to 25,000, and uh, some of them can cause, well, devastating uh, effects if they don't work normally. And this is due to the presence of mutations, but you know, are, are all genetic mutations really bad or, or that's not necessarily the case? Well, you, you have to consider that some mutations are irrelevant. Uh, they are localized in areas of the genome that are not terribly informative and you'll never know that, that you have those. Or another gene may cover for the function of the one that is faulty and in that sense, no effect, no obvious phenotype is noticed. Other mutations may have minor effects. Uh, maybe you can just about realize uh, on, on your screens uh, when I'm speaking that uh, my front teeth are quite separate from each other. And that is because I'm missing two teeth. I'm missing them genetically. I've never had had them. So my teeth have had more, more space to spread, and that's why they are somewhat separate at the front. Um, you know, technically, you could consider that a, a genetic defect. Uh, but obviously, apart from in my early years, when as a teenager I would have liked to uh, have plenty of blonde hair and a beautiful smile, uh, really, other than that, it hasn't caused me any, any real problems. And you also have to consider that evolution is based on mutations, and, and evolution is what allows us to adapt to a changing environment. So it's critical, really, for, for the survival of a species. So you have to uh, consider mutation uh, as uh, something that, yes, can lead to genetic diseases and, and considerable problems, but is part of our nature, is, is something that has allowed us to evolve, and I, you know, we, are, we are built in to evolve. 
But as I say, um, very unfortunately, in some cases, uh, those genetic mutations can have devastating effects. And what you have here is two people who are affected by some of those rare diseases, in this particular case, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy, uh, wheel, wheelchair-bound. Uh, in the case of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, these people, you know, sadly, uh, may die as, as young adults, uh, normally from respiratory failure, while in spinal muscular atrophy there is a very uh, large uh, range of severities. And I'll, I'll explain later that the most severely affected uh, people actually die uh, very young, while others can, can live uh, normally long lives but severely affected uh, because there is progressive degeneration uh, in their bodies. And this is because of mere mutations in, in a specific genes. So obviously this is uh, what very important. I tell you that there are, you know, over 9,000 rare diseases and that uh, is, is, is difficult to comprehend the number. And this is the beginning of the list. There exists a list of rare diseases which is continuously being updated as more and more are found because that number of about 9,600 is only an estimate. Uh, and I always ask people, uh, you know, if you had to read aloud the list of rare diseases, can you guess how long that would take you? Is someone uh, brave enough to, uh, to make a guess of how long it may take just to read the list of rare diseases? You're welcome to either use the chat or good. Uh, so we have, we have 10 hours, we have 24 hours, uh, Chloe and Matthew. Actually, that's not bad at all. Uh, well, 10 years is gone a, a little bit, uh, okay, 5, 20, 15, 48 hours. Actually, I'm quite impressed. The, uh, some of those estimates are very good. Uh, you know, I've calculated that it would take you maybe 18 hours to, if, to read the list aloud if you were not to stop at all. And if you consider that people can work on a specific uh, rare disease for their lifetime just to try to understand the basis of the disease, let alone develop a therapy for it, that will give you a, an impression of the monumental task that there is tackling uh, all these rare diseases. And uh, unfortunately, we don't actually have many treatments. I will touch on that later. Uh, but if you consider how many uh, rare diseases we have, I said over 9,600. And in the UK, how many diseases are screened for in newborns? Uh, so when a baby is born in the UK, provided that the parents agreed, a, a drop of blood is taken uh, from the baby and that is used to screen for a handful of, of diseases. Uh, the number varies according to, to the NHS Trust, uh, but it's relatively low. Can someone again make, make a guess of how many diseases, you know, as an average uh, are screened for in newborns in the UK currently? So we have uh, anything from two into thousands at 20, 30, 1, 2, 3, 11, okay, 100, 200. Okay, some of those are actually pretty good numbers. You see here, on average, about nine of those rare diseases are screened for. So nine out of 9,600. As I say, this, this varies according to the NHS Trust. Some of them screen up to 20 or 23. Uh, but all in all, it's a very low number compared to the total number of rare diseases. And the reason for that is that in most cases, we don't have much to offer uh, to the people affected in such a way that knowing early that they are affected by the disease wouldn't necessarily provide much benefit. That's the official position. Uh, in fact, uh, it's becoming increasingly clear that for many diseases, maybe 
at the very least a thousand, if not more, knowing early that that person is affected uh, may be beneficial uh, in the long run. Uh, because there is a lot of information accumulated over time uh, and because maybe the symptoms can tr be treated in a, most, in a more effective manner. But as you can imagine, adding uh, individual diseases to the test is expensive and there is always a cost uh, benefit uh, analysis done in order to increase the number of diseases that are tested for. Now, all this is changing very quickly. You know about genomics and you may have heard of a, of a quango called Genomics England, which is an organization that is promoting the use of uh, genomic technology in the UK. This is uh, strongly promoted by the government and actually the UK is at the forefront of genomic technology and genomic sequences. And we have already completed what was called the 100,000 Genome Project, in which the goal was to determine the complete sequence of the genome of particularly people affected by cancer, as well as their normal tissue, so cancer, can, carcinogenic tissue and normal tissue, as well as uh, the genomes of people affected by rare diseases and some of their relatives. Again, whenever you use, a, say, what we call a control, is to try to compare the sequence of the genome uh, in the affected person in a rare disease or tumor in a person with cancer versus uh, tissue uh, which is not affected, like normal tissue in cancer or a relative in a, a person affected by a rare disease. And this type of work is done in effectively sequencing factories like this one that I'm showing you at the Sanger Institute in Hingston Hall, in which these machines literally churn out genomic information in, at such a speed that actually the, the rate limiting a, a step is the analysis of, of that uh, genomic sequence. But this is uh, facilitating, there is no question about it, the, the diagnosis of all these uh, genetic diseases. And the government is really very keen to continue promoting this. So very recently, uh, only last September, the government published the 2020 strategy called Genome UK in order to promote the use of these technologies and to increase the uptake as part of the NHS. And I'll show you a slide in a minute uh, in the way to, to just highlight the way in which that is done. And uh, the government additional very recently, literally uh, last uh, month uh, in January, they published a rare diseases framework in order to make the most of the available technology as well as promote the use of all this in order to benefit the lives of people affected by, by rare diseases. So as I say, medicine is changing as, as we speak. We now have genomic medicine services in which genomic information for is used for the diagnosis of people affected by rare diseases, people affected by cancer, and we can expect that to expand to other, uh, to other clinical settings, like for instance, uh, in, in uh, acute uh, disease in, in infants, uh, there are clear benefits of using uh, genetic technology for diagnosis. So all this is being incorporated uh, in the context of the NHS. It's a slow, obviously, it involves the training of, of the workforce. You can't just implement nationwide uh, novel technologies without uh, providing the infrastructure and the training. And that is what the slowly uh, will be provided. But certainly there is really keen interest uh, to do that uh, in the UK. And once again, uh, the UK in this area is at, at the forefront of uh, clinical services. So I've told you that we don't have treatments for most of those uh, rare diseases, and that is true, but little by little, and the speed is, uh, is increasing, we are getting uh, more and more approvals of gene therapy products. And those come, uh, I would say, in three flavors. Some of them are what we call antisense oligonucleotides. In other words, 
very short sequences of nucleic acid that can be chemically synthesized. And appropriately delivered, they can have a therapeutic benefit uh, for the patient. Technically, those are not considered a gene therapy because gene therapy is technically for the US regulator, the FDA, or the European regulator and, and the UK regulator, because as you know, uh, the UK is no longer part of the EU. Uh, those gene therapies or advanced therapeutic medical products have to be uh, complex biologicals. And because these oligonucleotides can be chemically synthesized, they are not technically classified as gene therapies. But in the way uh, we have figured out the basis of the disease and the knowledge that has allowed the development of these therapeutics, they are squarely gene therapies. So that's why I'm including them uh, here. And they can now uh, allow treatment more or less successfully of different diseases, like some of those I've mentioned, Duchenne, spinal muscular atrophy, hereditary ATTR amyloidosis, for which there are two, uh, and so on. There are already some more that have been approved. More technically uh, gene therapy products uh, can be uh, vectors that have been engineered to have a therapeutic effect. Uh, so these are viruses of which the pathogenic elements, if any, have been removed and uh, they have been endowed uh, normally with a gene that can have a therapeutic benefit uh, for the patient. And those can be applied uh, in cancer or, or in various uh, uh, genetic diseases like uh, gencidine and imlogic are for cancer. Luxturna allows correction of a rare disease in the eye, a retinal dystrophy, so blindness. And Solgensma is another engineered virus uh, that allows treatment of, again, spinal muscular atrophy. And the third type of treatment available is, uh, in this case, the marketed product, the authorized product, is a genetically modified cell. So those are cells that are retrieved from patients and uh, or uh, people who are not affected by the disease. Uh, so autologous would be from the person affected, allogeneic would be from someone else. And those are either hematopoietic stem cells, so stem cells of the blood, or T cells that have been genetically modified to incorporate a gene of interest that will allow treatment of the disease. And again, this has been used for cancer. Uh, so Salmoxis, Kimraya, and, and Yescarta, and while Stream Valleys and Sinteglo are for, uh, for genetic diseases. If you are interested in following uh, this, this field, this hyperlink uh, will take you to a website managed for the International Society for Stem Cell Research that keeps tabs on marketed products worldwide in this particular area of research. So in, in the next section of, of my talk, I want to give you uh, an idea of what it is that you can do in practice uh, with gene therapy technology. And I have split it into six sections. And those are, you can introduce a mini gene, so a smaller version of a, of a natural gene for therapy. You can make a gene produce more or less of the protein you can kill cells, uh, and I can imagine that you can very quickly think of a particular area in which killing cells would be beneficial. Can you, uh, can you think of that? What, what do you reckon in, in which therapeutic context killing cells would be good? Absolutely. Matthew has already come up with the answer in cancer. Uh, something else that you can do is you can repair a gene. Uh, so if you have a faulty gene which is responsible for a genetic disease, uh, now we have at least the possibility of repairing that gene, which is really exciting. I'll tell you to, uh, through, through some of the genome editing technology. You can stop a gene from working. 
and uh, it may sound funny, but actually in, in, uh, in certain contexts, uh, preventing a gene from working can, can have a therapeutic effect. And very much the same technology that we use in all these contexts can also be used for vaccination. And I'll show you how in the context of the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic that we are undergoing, uh, some of the vaccination efforts are based on, on gene therapy technology. So I'm going to give you a relatively quick rundown on uh, how it's done, how this is done. In most cases, uh, as I said, this treatment is based on the delivery of nucleic acids to cells. And we have a variety of methods of, of doing that. Uh, we very grossly class them into non-viral, so methods that do not use engineered viruses, and viral methods, so methods that use engineered viruses. Uh, we can deliver naked DNA with no protection. Uh, that's uh, relatively uh, rare in terms of use. It can be combined with lipids or proteins to compact and, and protect it uh, in molecules that we call lipoplex or polyplex. And you can even have recombinant cells microencapsulated to protect them from the outside environment. And if you use uh, viruses engineered to deliver your nucleic acid of interest, various, uh, fam various families of viruses have been used for this purpose. Uh, uh, my lab, for instance, work on a type of retroviral vectors that you all have heard of, is uh, HIV. And we use uh, modified forms of HIV that are unable to cause disease and are very effective to deliver genes of interest to cells. Other people work with other vectors like adenoviruses or adeno-associated viruses that normally would cause colds. Uh, and all these and other viruses can be engineered uh, to deliver those uh, nucleic acid molecules. There are two ways, uh, very briefly, to, uh, to deliver uh, those molecules. Uh, one is just to inject the person affected uh, with the therapy. And uh, another one is to retrieve cells from the person affected, engineer them uh, in culture, in the lab, check that everything has gone well uh, through a quality control process, and if that is the case, return those genetically modified cells back to the patient. The direct way we call in vivo. And the roundabout way of genetic modification outside the body, we call an ex vivo approach. And depending on the disease, either, of one, either or the other would be more appropriate. So going through this... Uh, panel of six examples that I have for you. How do you introduce a minigene? Well, very effectively, DNA uh, or viruses are nucleic acid carriers, basically. So we can hijack their natural properties, remove parts of their genome that can cause disease, and instead replace them with parts that can have a therapeutic benefit. For instance, if a person lacks a particular gene uh, for which they are mutant, we can deliver a normal copy of the gene uh, using an engineered virus. And the uh, classical example of that, because it was the first disease in which there was a very clear therapeutic benefit, was an immunodeficiency. These are diseases of the immune system in which uh, the, that protection uh, in the person doesn't work appropriately, and they are more prone to infections. And those infections, those multiple recurrent infections, are really life-threatening so much so that those babies often fail to thrive. They don't gain weight because of the uh, challenge that those recurrent uh, infections have on their development. So in this particular disease called X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency, a bit of a mouthful, or Eschides X1, uh, the, the faulty gene encodes a cytokine receptor, uh, or more exactly the common gamma chain of the, uh, of the cytokine receptor, 
and the therapeutic approach was to deliver a working copy of the gene using what we call a retroviral uh, vector. So uh, cells from uh, the affected person are taken, uh, engineered uh, in the lab, uh, checked uh, to see that the engineering has gone successfully and returned back uh, by transplant into the patient. And you can see that the initial studies demonstrated that this actually was a very successful approach because most of these children would have died with any other uh, therapeutic interventions. Uh, so this success rate is very remarkable. But as you can see that there were occasional examples of adverse events. I'm not going to dwell into that, but if there is interest, uh, maybe we can address that uh, through questions. A second example is uh, with genetic technology, we can make a gene produce more or less protein. In the example I'm going to show you, the gene will produce more protein. So uh, spinal muscular atrophy is a severe uh, neurodegenerative disease. It's due to mutations in the SMN1 gene. Uh, SMN stands for survival of motor neuron. And in people who do not have a working copy of SMN1, they really rely on the presence of the SMN2 gene, which is a very similar gene, but different enough to be very sluggish at producing the normal protein, the normal SMN protein. Uh, basically, about 90% of the SMN protein comes from the SMN1 gene, about 10% from the SMN2 gene. If your SMN1 gene is not working, then you are left with that 10% or so of normal. And that is not sufficient and can lead to this very severe disease. Well, people have realized, scientists have realized that by changing the pattern of processing of the messenger RNA for the SMN2 gene, they can actually regenerate the normal messenger RNA. So literally by using a very small oligonucleotide, one of these chemically synthesized molecules, the small nucleic acid molecules, they can change the way the messenger RNA for the SMN2 gene is processed in a way that is now full again. It contains this uh, exon 7 that normally is taken out and you get more of the normal protein. And could, uh, is this therapeutic? Well, it is. If I show you through drawings, children who are affected by the most severe type of SMA would normally die within two years uh, of birth, uh, really with no exceptions. If you can treat them from very early on with this chemically synthesized oligonucleotide, these children can achieve developmental milestones that are unheard of in this disease, really, like sitting up unaided and standing up in children who normally by this age would have died. So the, the effect of these therapeutics can be absolutely uh, tremendous. What else can you do with, uh, with gene therapy? Well, as, as we were discussing, uh, you can kill cells uh, through cancer. Um, this, and I will just mention it in a slide, has become a really, really important development because this is now no longer for a rare disease. We are talking about cancer here. So you can very effectively treat B-cell leukemias with genetically engineered cells. In this diagram, this is the genetically engineered cell which expresses uh, or produces on the surface a protein which we call CAR, C-A-R, or chimeric antigen receptor that makes it recognize the yellow protein present in the uh, B-cell leukemia cells called CD19. And the recognition of the yellow protein by this multicolor one present in the engineered T-cell triggers the killing of the tumor cell by the T-cell. So T-cells are harvested from patients 
and it has been shown that these cells from anywhere in the world can be shipped to a central facility in the U.S. where they are engineered. So they produce this chimeric antigen receptor and return back to the local hospital where the patient is being treated, where they are reinfused back into the patient and have a phenomenal effect on those leukemias. So many patients now uh, who uh, had been through all the standard treatments for B-cell leukemias have been treated and have gone into remission uh, when normally, sadly, uh, they would have achieved the end of the line in terms of available treatments. So this uh, has demonstrated that the logistics are possible to deliver a gene therapy worldwide uh, involving the genetic engineering of cells uh, from, from the patient. Uh, and this, as you can imagine, has uh, in, brought in massive interest from, bi from the biotech industry and, and big pharma. We can also repair a gene. And uh, uh, how do we do that? Well, this obviously is really exciting because this is highly accurate technology anymore. We are not talking about delivering an extra copy, doing uh, sort of gross changes. We can actually introduce now specific changes into the genome uh, through a process that we call uh, genome editing. We could do that before, but I've recently described technology, which I'm sure you will have heard of, or most likely you will have heard of, called CRISPR-Cas, or this CRISPR scissors is the typical representation of it, allows us to uh, make very specific modifications uh, into the genome. Uh, and for that, uh, we commonly need to cut the genome at the region where we want to introduce the modification. And that's what CRISPR-Cas has allowed uh, much more easily than before. So this is a process that we could do before, but CRISPR-Cas has facilitated it so much that most labs uh, doing genetic technology in the lab are now using this technology. It really has spread like, like wildfire. And how can we repair uh, genes by doing that. Well, if you have uh, a mutant gene uh, with a similar representation to what we had before, the orange blob in this case is the mutation. If we can deliver to the cells a normal copy of that gene and at the same time uh, induce a break uh, effectively in the chromosome in that gene, we can trigger internal uh, repair mechanisms in the cells that mediate the introduction of the corrected sequence into the genome. And in that way, they correct the gene. We call this process genome editing. And while there is as yet no marketed technology that is based on this, this is highly promising. And there are multiple diseases in which this is being pursued as a therapeutic approach. Similarly, with uh, effectively the same technology, we can uh, stop a gene from working. And the way we do that is, in this case, we have a normal gene, uh, and we would like to prevent it from working by introducing a mutation. Well, if we, again using CRISPR, cut the target gene, but we do not provide a molecule for the repair, the cells will attempt the repair of that uh, broken DNA. And in doing so, more often than not, the repair mechanisms introduce small changes at the point of cutting that are in technical terms a mutation and will prevent the function of the gene, leading to its inactivation. Uh, to give you an example where this could be therapeutic, for instance, is in the HIV field. Uh, in order to enter the cells of the immune system, HIV binds not just one protein on the surface of those cells, but more than one. And one is what we call the HIV core receptor, called CCR5. There are people who naturally lack CCR5, and they are more resistant to HIV infection. And the destruction of the CCR5 gene 
in people affected by HIV is being explored as a therapy for the disease. And in fact, the, the data that are available out there are encouraging. Uh, the only issue with uh, alternative therapies when there is already drugs on the market, and you will know that for HIV, there are a number of approved uh, drugs uh, already marketed, it's, it's relatively difficult to introduce a new technology, but it is possible. And finally, uh, using this type of technology, you can actually vaccinate people. And I wanted to give you just examples based on, on the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic, because you all have heard of uh, Pfizer and BioNTech vaccines, Moderna vaccines, the University of Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccines. Well, uh, two of those groups of vaccines, uh, those based on DNA or RNA, or those based on viral vectors, use genetic technology. Uh, to have a vaccination effect. Uh, so this uh, would be the case of Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech, and this would be in the case of the Oxford AstraZeneca, uh, which uses an engineer uh, called uh, virus in order to deliver the relevant part of the coronavirus. So the same type of technology can be used uh, for vaccination. Now, I've told you that there are already a, a good handful of uh, marketed products available to treat these diseases. What I haven't told you is that the price of those is astronomical. So to treat one eye of a person affected by the retinal dystrophy that can be uh, treated with Luxturna costs $425,000. To treat a person with a severe uh, immunodeficiency, uh, which requires genetically uh, engineered cells, would cost almost 600,000 euro. And to treat a person affected by spinal muscular atrophy with the spin rasa, uh, would cost about 540,000 euro in the first year, and about half as much every year thereafter. If you equal the cost of a, of a dollar and a euro with a pound, which is roughly where they are at the moment, uh, you can realize that these are tremendous costs. So that is going back to the, the comment I made before that the availability of a medicine doesn't necessarily guarantee that there is going to be access for every person affected by the disease because there has we have to find ways for national health services and insurance companies to cover the cost of this and this is a very big uh, bottleneck in the field in order of applicability of these diseases uh, uh, but as you can imagine, particularly with the demonstration that you can apply the same technology to common diseases, uh, the value of this market is really spiraling up and you know is, is calculated in many, many billions of dollars. And the companies that are involved in this space, when they are uh, bought and sold, they are talking about billions of dollars. So the, the relative importance of this area is increasing very, very quickly. So just uh, wrapping up for today, I wanted to mention a couple of questions uh, to, to just give you food for thought, uh, uh, which perhaps you can pick up during the week and we can come back to it uh, in the initial 15 minutes uh, next week. And those would be, you know, how would you choose a virus if you wanted to make it into a gene therapy vector? And would you sequence the genome of every newborn to diagnose genetic diseases with, with the current knowledge? And I've given you a few pointers for you to, to do a little thinking uh, around that area. And um, just uh, to wrap up, and if there is time, we can pick up some of the questions, or otherwise we'll pick them up uh, next week. Uh, at Royal Holloway, we organize a Rare Disease Day event. Uh, there is a, an official international Rare Disease Day. It's uh, always the last day of February, because on a leap year, the 29th of February is a rare day. And uh, this is celebrated internationally in over 100 countries. And for the last 10 years, and this will be our 11th at Royal Holloway, we have celebrated the day by inviting students of uh, basically your age and school years 
to uh, listen to a set of lectures, to attend at an exhibition, uh, to do some hands-on work in the labs, to talk to our undergraduates so you can discuss everything from university life to, to your interests. And, and again, to do uh, paper-based activities. Uh, in this case, it was a diagnosis, a rare disease diagnosis activity. Obviously, in the context of the pandemic this year, we cannot receive uh, visits, but we have organized a virtual rare disease day, yeah. and we are going to make it as, as similar as possible to our uh, presential face-to-face -face day of past years. Uh, and if your school is interested, I think we still have a few, but not many uh, spaces available for school bookings. Uh, so this is the hyperlink uh, to follow. And finally, I just, as I mentioned before, uh, I've got to meet really very uh, can-do people, people who are really uh, fantastic examples of what you can achieve. And, uh, you know, they are really inspirational. And that's not because they have a rare disease, but because of what they achieve, despite the fact that they have a rare disease. Helene Rains, for is actually a graduate from Royal Holloway, uh, who is a uh, Paralympic uh, gold medal winner. And, uh, and Srin Madipali here is an entrepreneur uh, who has two degrees, founded uh, what became uh, known as the Disabled Airbnb. And this company was purchased by Airbnb and, and uh, uh, Srin moved to California to, to develop that company further. And uh, it's just uh, incredible, really, what these people managed to achieve despite the fact that their lives are, are very complicated. And finally, uh, my last two slides, I, I would like you to invite you really to join the genomic medicine revolution. As I say, this is happening. We have the technology that can that allows specific modifications of the genome and you can make all the changes that I've mentioned. This is being brought into uh, the medical services. It's spearheaded by, by genomic sequencing, but the, the, the therapeutics will follow. And even if you don't want to be a doctor or you don't want to work in a lab, there are piles of data being generated uh, in the analysis of those genomic sequences. Uh, so even if you what you like is basically computer based, then there's still plenty of work for you. So you know, come in and join the genomic medicine uh, revolution. And my last word really is to thank you, because I know that there are many different things that you could be doing rather than listening to me. So I appreciate that. And jokingly, I used to say that as most of you are underage, those two uh, you can forget. But actually, in the context of the COVID pandemic, I can say that youngsters and adults at the moment can forget about these two and will have to make do with just uh, having a good sleep at night time. And uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for your attention uh, and lastly, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Rafael. It was a great talk. We have a lot of questions, so probably I suggest that we come back to it uh, next week and, uh, and, uh, and consider all those interesting questions at the beginning of next week. And uh, we, also, we also got some homework from Rafael on the slide, which is uh, quite, quite inspirational. So I will take out from your slide that little homework and paste it to Padlet and really encourage you to, to not to go home and forget about this problem, but keep thinking over the week and uh, we come back on those homeworks as well next week. Thank you so much. And next Thank week it will be a, a new interesting topic, which will be brain and memory. So a totally new field by another excellent colleague of mine, Philip Chen. So see you next week. <laughs>